first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for inviting me to Bonn. So I'm very happy to be here. Uh, the title I gave for this talk are what are the best crop model parameter values and how to get them. And that's what we'll be talking about. This is a lot of what I'll be presenting is based on a group called the AGMIP calibration activity. So AGMIP, for those who don't know it, is an international project that was initiated, I think, in 2011. It has very seriously changed the whole way of doing crop modeling by encouraging uh, a lot the, a lot more collaboration between crop modelers. So whereas before it was extremely rare to have multiple groups working on the same, with different models working on the same problem, now this has become uh, quite common. Um, yes, sorry. Yeah, so what we'll be talking about are just a very brief one slide reminder of what crop models are, then the question are the parameters of crop models really that important? And not to keep you in suspense, I'll already give you the answer to that, which is yes. What do we mean by the best parameter values? How do we get those best parameter values? And then where do we think we're going in the future? So a crop model is a set of coupled equations describing plant development and growth in soil processes. This is a schematic diagram of a crop model, uh, not any, not particularly uh, specifically a crop model that we've been working with, but one that had a nice schematic diagram. So what you have on the left are processes related to light interception and biomass uh, development. So there are equations behind each one of these boxes. And then on the right-hand side, you have uh, the sink development, that is the number of grains and the potential grain size. In the middle, you have processes related to both of those. At the bottom, you have processes related to root growth and soil processes. And then all of these are embodied in equations, which to simulate, you would run these equations day by day. And at the end of the season, you would have a way of calculating final yield. So we're talking about something, a, a set of a fairly large number of coupled equations to calculate various different outputs of the crop, uh, water, uh, crop soil and atmosphere system. And these models are used for evaluating crop management options that could be at the field scale or at the regional scale. They're widely used now to evaluate the impact of climate change on crop production. They're used to design characteristics for new varieties that would be well adapted to specific situations and for various other things. So what about the crop model parameters? Are these really important? Well, let's look at what we know so far about the way the crop models. The, uh, one of the main effects of this AGMIT project has been to look at multi-model ensembles, that is this multiple different models simulating the same system based on the same data. And what you find is a large variability between models. This example is from one of the earlier studies in uh, the AGMIP project. So what you have here are a number of different environments. These are all at the same location, but different planting dates. And some of these planting dates in addition had additional uh, artificial heating. The point of this was to see what happens, how well models respond to different average temperatures, especially high temperatures. This is for wheat, especially how wheat responds to high temperatures. And what you can see is the height of the lines is yield. So you can see some of these environments actually had zero yield, meaning that the temperature stress, high temperature stress was so important that in fact there was no yield at all. What we want to look at here are the these thinner gray lines, the dotted lines, 
each one of those lines represents a different modeling group. And one of the major uh, aspects of these results and a bit of a surprise was the very large variability between different groups. If you look at this first environment all the way to the left, you can see that there is that the, the different models have results going from uh, zero tons per hectare up to almost eight tons per hectare. It's a huge variability between the different models. And what that means is somebody who is just using whatever model they have convenient, the model that there is that is most used in their institution, they choose, that's like choosing one of these models at random, you could get a, a result that is very uncertain because if you had chosen a different model, you would get a very different result. Obviously, a very uncomfortable situation for crop modelers. Next question is, what is causing this huge variability between different models? We would want to know because we want to reduce this variability. We don't want to have this large uncertainty in the things that we're simulating. You can show quite easily that if you fix the inputs, and that was the case in, uh, <clears throat> in the graph that I just showed, uh, what you have here for each one of these environments, the inputs are fixed. These are some fixed set of temperatures and solar radiation. And, and water. So if you fix those inputs, the total variance between the different simulations is due to, is just the sum of two terms. The first term is what we call structure variance. That is, there are a lot of different possible sets of equations that people can use and the different models, different modeling groups use different models. And these different models have different equations. So you have this structure uncertainty or structure variance. And then even with the same model structure, different groups could have different parameter values, even though they're all using the same data for calibration, but they could do the calibration in different ways. The parameters that are not estimated by calibration could be different between the different groups. So you have, in addition, uncertainty due to the parameters. And what you can show is that the total variance for each particular environment, if you look at the variance between the different simulated values, this is just the sum of the structure variance plus the parameter variance. Most of the work up to date has been on structure variance, trying to understand why are there, what are the differences between different models and are there better ways of, better equations that we should be using, for instance, for the effect of temperature, just to have one example, the effect of temperature on on, on biomass accumulation, different models use uh, different equations. Is there, can, can we check all of these different equations and try to find the one that seems to be best? So a lot of, most of the work on trying to reduce uncertainty has been on trying to reduce structure uncertainty. But some of the recent studies that we've done show that in fact, parameter uncertainty might be, is, is important and might even be the major cause of uncertainty in these simulated values. This is an example of the results that we found. So what you have here um, are again, this is a multi-model simulation study, simulating two things on left-hand side, days from sowing to anthesis for wheat crops in a number of different environments. And on the right-hand side, number of days from sowing to physiological maturity. And the different rows are different environments. So these are uh, different locations and planting dates in Australia. And on each row, you have a number of different circles. Each circle is a different modeling group. So this is the same, uh, just a different presentation, but same kind of result we saw earlier a lot of variability between the different modeling groups. However, what you have here in addition is among these modeling groups, some of the groups used the same model. So there were three groups that used 
the, the red model and three groups that use the blue model and two groups that use the green model. I don't want to go into which model this was, but they these the circles with the same color were using the same model. So you can look at the variability between the circles of the same color and see how much variability there is not due to structure because they're all using the same structure, just due to parameter values. The differences between those groups are differences in parameter values. And I'm not sure that it's easy to see from this, but if you, you get the general impression that there is a lot of uncertainty due to the choice of parameters. This is a summary of the results we've seen so far. This is the height of the bar here is the percentage of total uncertainty, the percentage of total variance that is due to the to uncertainty in the parameters. So if the bars that are over 0 0.5 mean that in those particular cases, more than half of the total uncertainty was due to parameter uncertainty. And what you have here are the, diff the different bars are three different data sets. So from France with the wheat variety Apache, France with the wheat variety Bermude, and a set of Australian sites. And then for each of these data sets, you have prediction to different physiological stages. So you have time from sowing to BBCH30, which is stem elongation, to BBCH55, which is um, heading, then to anthesis and to maturity. Overall, if you take just the average of all of these bars, the average is 0.61, which means that about 60% of the total variability in the, these studies, and this is a fairly large number of studies, but only for physiology, for only for phonology, sorry, the overall more than half of the uncertainty is due to parameters. So parameter values are important because it's the uncertainty in parameter values that is causing a large part of the variability in simulated values. There's no consensus how to estimate them. What we saw is that groups using the same model have quite different parameter values. So there is obviously no consensus on that, that, that leads to all groups using the same methods of estimating parameters. So we need better methods and better estimates for parameter values. Okay, next section is what, what exactly are we looking for? What do we mean by the best parameter values? First of all, we have to define what target population we're talking about. Where are we? do we want to use our model? And that is the, the set of situations where we want to apply the model and where we want and where we want our parameter values to give good results. So for instance, the target population might be wheat fields in Australia for predicting yield. And what we want are the best parameters that give the best prediction for that population. Think of a simple statistical model, y equals a plus bx, a simple linear model where you have measurement of pairs of y and x. So x is the explanatory variable, y is the response variable, a very, very simple model. What we would do in that case, if we had pairs of values of x and y, we would calibrate the model. For instance, we would use a standard statistical method, least squares, for instance, to estimate the parameters a and b. And if the response were really linear, then our estimated values of a and b would as we had more and more data, would tend toward the true values of A and B. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter which X values we got our, we had as data, whichever range of X values we had, we would tend toward the true values of A and B. But suppose that the true model is not linear. The response of Y to X is not a, truly a linear model, but it's something else. What happens in that case? Well, in that case, we're in a different realm that is not very much talked about in statistics. It's called the realm of misspecified models. And you can show 
uh, that crop models are almost certainly misspecified. We are not in the case where we have really the exact response of the, the outputs to the inputs. With misspecified models, this is what we know about them. What's the the statistical theory says about misspecified models, there are no true parameter values. Since the we don't have the true function, we don't have any, there is no notion of true parameter values. But there are best parameter values. Those are the parameter values that minimize the mean squared error for the target population that we're interested in. And very encouraging, as we get more and more data, the parameters that we estimate by least squares, for instance, tend toward those best parameter values. So it's still worthwhile to get more and more data to try to get as close as we can to these best parameter values. But we have to be very careful because the best parameter values are going to depend on exactly what part of the, of the input values we've explored. So it depends exactly on the conditions that have been sampled. Here is an example to show you what's happening here. So here, suppose the re true response is a sigmoid curve, the black curve, and we have a model which is a straight line. So this is obviously, try to think of this, this the, the sigmoid curve is a crop model and uh, is a, is a, is a, is a crop, cropping system and the green line is our crop model. So it's not the, exactly the same as the true response. As we have more and more data, so going from the top left to the bottom right, we have more and more data. And what you find is that this straight line is becoming as close as it can be to simulating the sigmoid curve. So it's never going to exactly, our model, regardless of how much data we have, will never exactly reproduce the sigmoid curve, but it can get, it as we get more and more data, we're getting as close as we can get with this approximation. What we see here is what happens if we sample only part of the sigmoid curve, that is only part of our target population. So on the top left, where you sample everything, this is a reminder of what the best linear model looks like. And then as you go to the top right, if you sample you have a large sample, but only from small values of X, that is this shallow green line is the best model for that part of the target population. If you sample in the middle of the target population, you get this fairly uh, steep line. And then if you sample toward the right-hand side of the target population, you get again this, this shallow line that tries to reproduce the, the top part of the sigmoid curve. What we're showing here is that depending on exactly what conditions you're sampling, you get you have different best parameter values. Okay, so that's why you need a sample from the full target population if you want to get best parameter values. If you your target population includes both humid years and dry years, and you sample only humid years, you're going to have a problem. If your target population includes early sowing and late sowing management, and you only sample part of that, you're going to have a problem. If you get your best parameters from phenotyping, from detailed field experiments, from detailed phenotyping experiments in some particular situation, those aren't going to be the best for the target population because these are some specific part of the target population that you're testing. So how do you estimate uh, crop model parameters? Well, there are two parts of this. First is the data, and the second is how you use that data to estimate the parameters. Very often people assume that the data is fixed. This is the data I have available. This is the data. These are the data that I measured in my field experiments. And my problem is how to estimate my parameters based on those data. It's important, I think, to enlarge the problem and realize that there may be ways of having more and different kinds of data. In any case, these are the two as these are the two things that are important in estimating parameter values. 
let's look at the typical way of estimating parameter values is to combine two types of data. So we have detailed experiments on individual processes, for instance, leaf, leaf senescence as a function of temperature and especially how does leaf senescence increase when you have high temperature stress. So you can look at controlled environment experiments, try to get information on how much high temperature increases leaf senescence, and then estimate the parameters for leaf senescence due to high temperature from those experiments. But those, that's not for your target population, that's usually in very controlled environments and you hope that those parameters, you're going to use those parameters elsewhere because it, you can't do this experiment everywhere in your target population. Most of the parameters and crop models come from experiments like that. But then you have a second source of data, which are field experiments from the target population, which you usually do is estimate a few parameters of your model from those experiments. And you hope that by doing that, you've adapted your model specifically to the target, even though you've only estimated a few parameters in that way. So how to do that? How do you actually use the field data to do the estimation? That's what this AGMIP calibration group has been working on. And the major principles that we've been applying are, it's important to look at the full set of calibration decisions, this whole series of decisions that you make in deciding how to use the field data to estimate your parameters. and then. The other major principle is we want to use standard statistical methods. And so these are the, the different aspects of the calibration. You have to, to choose your default values. You have to decide which observed value variables to use because often you have a range of variables that have been observed. The form of the objective function, the choice of parameters to estimate, the search algorithm. So these are the different things we've been looking at. I just want to mention very briefly that there are there is a different way. There are other ways of estimating parameters, but that's definitely not the only way. And this is a second, very different approach to estimating parameter values that uh, we've looked at, which is to use not field trials, but phenotyping experiments as the basis. You can use detailed phenotyping for each cultivar that you're interested in and estimate the parameters for that cultivar. And in this case, you have, you're taking into account the cultivar, so not the full target population, but at least the choice of cultivar is taken into account by using phenotyping experiments. And then what you can do is a statistical correction from field trials to adapt to the target population. And this is an example of the results of doing that. So what you have here are, uh, let's take the, the top left-hand graph with all of these dots and lines. The, what you're measuring here is the error in the model based on phenotyping. So you, you have this phenotyping model, then you apply it to a number of field locations. For each of these locations, you have an error in yield. This is a measurement of yield, and what you have up here is a measurement of how much error there is in the phenotyping model uh, respect to the field, the, respect to the field data. And as a function of, in this particular case, precipitation, and what you see is, and each one of these lines is a different cultivar, what you see is, in general, there is a dependence of the error in the phenotyping model with respect to precipitation. And so you can use that correct, you can use that dependence to correct the phenotyping model. So you use this kind of error, this, this model for the error in order to correct the data. So this is a very different way of using two different kinds of data, using in this case phenotyping data and field data. Where are we going to next? Well, I said there are probably two important paths to improve parameters. One is to get more data. Look at cultivar trials, look at phenotyping data, look at remote sensing data. More data you have, certainly the better you can do. And then the next, Second problem, also a major problem, is better methods of using that data. In particular, 
complicated because we have multiple data layers, for instance, phenotyping data and remote sensing data are cultivar trials. And, 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 uh, and, and detailed experiments, controlled environment experiments. So you have different kinds of data with different relations to the target population. And the question is, how do you combine all of these things? So that's the, the two major questions that we're looking at. Thank you.